everyone. Welcome to the next episode of LumCon Science Talks. Um, just if you have not attended a science talk previously, um, the way that we work this is that you guys can interact with us um, through the question box. So you'll see a, the question box. Um, you'll just type in your question and that will come to me and uh, we'll make sure that we interact with you in some form. So if you don't mind, uh, find that question box and type something in so that I know that you guys know how to use it. Right? Um, while you're doing that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. McLean. I like how I'm Craig tonight and not Crane. I was really hoping to <laughs> think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's thank like, you once again. It's like your new science talk handle. <laughs> I was kind of shocked to see the name was right. Anyway, so welcome everyone else to the uh, online lecture series. I'm Dr. Craig McLean, the executive director of LumCon. And uh, tonight is my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Akainuk, uh, who is a Turkish aerospace engineer and oceanographer. Um, who received her PhD from the MIT Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institution. And she works on problems of biological and computational vision underwater. Um, and in addition to using sort of off the shelf style cameras for scientific imaging, she also uses very uh, fancy hyperspectral sensors to investigate how the world uh, appears to non humans. Um, and she's done a variety of professional, technical, and scientific uh, diving and has a variety of scientific uh, certifications and has done underwater field work in the Bering Sea, in the Red Sea, Antarctic, Caribbean, and Northern and uh, South Pacific and Atlantic. Uh, and of course, in her native Aegean Sea. Um, she is a 2019 uh, Blavatnik Award uh, winner for the uh, Young Scientist in Physics and Engineering for her amazing uh, postdoctoral research on resolving a fundamental problem in underwater computer vision, and that's the reconstruction of lost colors and contrast, and which is how I first learned about her research a few years ago, um, seeing uh, how she developed these amazing algorithms that allow uh, for uh, accurate viewing of the underwater world. And uh, she's now a tenure track member, uh, faculty member at the Department of Marine Technologies at the University of Haifa in Israel. And her research lab is located on the Red Sea at the Inter University Institute of Marine Sciences in Alot. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. I'm so excited to have you uh, and to hear about more about your research. Thank you, Craig. I am. Uh, I want to thank you very much for this invitation. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, and you guys tell me if everything looks okay. Yes, you can. You yeah, can see I see. It? A, I see a blank screen. You see a blank screen. That's not good. Okay. We have just done this minutes before the. Uh... <laughs> no, I know. That's technology. <laughs> yes. Let's try again. That's much better. Yay. Much better? Yes. Excellent. Yes. Now it's good? Yep. Okay. Excellent. So, uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, uh, maybe good evening, everyone. It's good morning for me. It's 3 a.m. where I am in Eilat in Israel, but I'm very excited to have you join me on this adventure to think and try and understand why we have colors in the ocean. So very briefly, here's how I structured today's talk. I'm going to tell you very briefly about myself in addition to uh, what Craig has already mentioned. And then I'm going to tell you about some of my ongoing visual ecology projects that I won't be talking about in detail. And then I'll move on to the actual question that we want to investigate. What do colors mean in the ocean? Can colors give us scientific insights? And why is imaging colors in the ocean such a difficult problem? And then I'll tell you about 
my contributions towards the solution of this problem, specifically through a new equation that I've developed and a new algorithm that I've developed. So let's get started. Um, as Craig mentioned, I was born and raised in Turkey, and that's actually where I got my bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering. I graduated first from my department and I won a scholarship to do a master's at MIT also in aerospace engineering. So I graduated in 2005 and I was specializing in the thermodynamic efficiencies of aircraft engines. And I really did not feel so much passion for that. So I thought to myself, okay, uh, maybe it's time to leave the university maybe I should check out industry and make some money. So I got a real job, which was a consulting job in information technology. I worked in the US as a consultant for three years in the field of finance. And maybe some of you will remember 2008 was not a great year for the finance industry. So uh, as things started to evolve and I realized I was working so hard all day uh, from before sunrise to almost midnight in the office in front of a computer and the, the the market was horrible i just thought to myself maybe this is not the way to go what is a job that i can look forward to showing up to every morning and that will make me feel inspired and what make me want to work more and more passionately and i thought about this and i thought I found the answer and the answer was a job that puts the ocean in my life every day. So at the end of 2008, uh, with the financial crisis and also my personal uh, work crisis, I went back to school. I went back to MIT and got a PhD in the joint program between MIT and Woods Hole. I finished that in 2014 and then I never looked back. After that, I did a postdoc in Israel, I did a postdoc in Panama, I worked briefly in Germany, then I worked in Princeton, and after that I worked at, in Florida as a research scientist at Harbor Branch Oceanographic for two years. And now I am an uh, assistant professor at the University of Haifa, which is in the north of Israel, but my lab is located on the Red Sea. This is the campus where we are. I am right now sitting in the building that the red arrow is pointing to. And the most important uh, point of this slide, in addition to our beautiful campus, is that I'm hiring. I am looking for outstanding students, interns, postdocs. So if you are interested, if you know of any uh, folks in school who are interested in working on problems of imaging and vision and using uh, bio-inspired technologies, to explore the ocean, please send them my way. My uh, email, I will show it at the end of the at the end of the slides, and you can always also ask Mert or Dr. McLean for for it later. So after that advertising, what does an aerospace engineer do in oceanography? Well, my uh, non-traditional background actually allows me to work at the intersection of a number of fields. And I most often find myself working with ocean optics, which is a lot of physics, computer vision, which is a lot of math and programming, and visual ecology, which is uh, biology and ecology. And this combination of areas necessarily means I somehow also work with ocean biogeochemistry. So, I am not uh, a pure, let's say, physical oceanographer, a pure chemical oceanographer. I'm an engineer and I work, I find that I work as a bridge between different fields, solving problems that folks in any field might need. And I really enjoy being that bridge. So before I move on to the role of colors, I wanna show you some of my ongoing research that combines visual ecology and engineering. So two projects I picked for you today are gonna be on the camouflage of the body patterns of color cuttlefish and the color vision of sea turtles. I wanna start with my favorite video of all time. You have probably seen this video, it's very popular. It was taken by my PhD advisor, Dr. Roger Hanlon, 
in the Grand Cayman in 2005. So as I play this video, I want you to look at the rock in the frame. Just keep looking at the rock. And shortly after, you will see that this was not a rock. This was an octopus that was camouflaging itself against a rock. And the I think we're only way- I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think we're having some technical difficulties. We're not see. We're just still seeing your intro slide. Oh, okay. We're seeing like your uh, PowerPoint or your Keynote uh, like uh, app, and not there. We go. Yep. Well, but now this is. But we're not seeing. You're not seeing this slide now. You what are no, you seeing now? We're seeing a white screen right now. Oh, wow, that's very interesting. But now you can see it. We can, but you would have to like, we can see like your app screen now, basically, with your slides on the the side. Right, but when I maximize, then that's when you cannot see it, I understand. Yeah. This is very uh, unusual, <laughs> okay. Let's Maybe see. Maybe if you do, as you change slides, just click on the left-hand side in this screen. And yep, yep, yep. there's lots that way. Okay, so um, you guys, well, the missed the most important thing, which would have been the photo <laughs> of the campus. <laughs> well, I hope you imagined it looked like this. So you did not, uh, you, the audience did not see this. No, we didn't see any of this. I thought you were talking through your first slide, so I didn't say anything before this. No, but oh no no okay wow no no absolutely not so listen I will uh I will just rewind two minutes we we will <laughs> thank, have plenty of time thank you so much I appreciate it no problem no problem uh, I'm glad we we stopped this before going too far <laughs> okay well so my apologies about the technical difficulties but I want to go back to the most important slide of this whole presentation which is our beautiful campus and my current location. And again, I want to uh, emphasize that uh, I'm looking for students, interns and postdocs. So please keep this in mind. So moving forward, as I mentioned, my research bridges different technical areas. And these are mostly ocean optics, computer vision and visual ecology. So here's where it's very important to see my slides because I'm going to show you a lot of colorful visual things and the first two projects are with uh, around cuttlefish camouflage and sea turtle color vision so now we are back to where we were before <laughs> I got notified the screen wasn't working so let's play this video again. This is Roger Henlon, my PhD advisor. This is a video he was very fortunate to take on a trip to the Grand Cayman in 2005. Tell me if you guys can't see the video playing. So now it should be playing and we should all be looking at the rock. Yes? Yes. We, uh, yeah. yes. yes, excellent, excellent. So this is a very, very popular video. I'm sure folks have seen this and if not, they will see it at some point. It keeps being recycled in the social media a lot. So this octopus is, we're going to play it backwards. Look at the way it's changing its colors and body pattern. Between the eyes is where the change starts because that's where the brain is. And then it spreads through the whole skin. And within a very short time frame, you see that it blends not just by color, but also by texture, by granularity. It changes its skin from flat, from 2D to 3D. It's really remarkable. But perhaps what's more remarkable, I'll just play it one more, one more time as I talk, is what's more remarkable than the animal being able to do this within milliseconds is that it, it can do it while being colorblind. And what does that mean? So as far as we know, this animal in its eye does not have the mechanism to discriminate colors, which makes it colorblind, which makes it a monochromat. So without being able to sense colors around it, at least in a way we are aware of, it can blend in with its surroundings. And that's just absolutely fascinating. 
Now, I've been working with cuttlefish, which is a relative of octopus, also delicious equally, um, but easier to keep in the lab and run experiments with. And I've been giving them these crazy backgrounds that are artificial and they are not found in nature, but I know their statistics. So by time-lapsing them on a small arena, on a crazy background, I can study which pattern, whose statistics I know, right? I designed the pattern, this is a sine wave, I know exactly how this pattern is described. I can correlate the pattern that the animal is choosing to display when, where he is in the arena, and against which pattern. So this teaches us something about the decisions they're making when they decide to put on one of the many endless camouflage uniforms that they have. So this project actually generated uh, terabytes and terabytes of data and I'm still analyzing it, but I have a lot of cuttlefish that probably went crazy on very artificial backgrounds trying to blend in. So this is ongoing. And the next project I wanted to briefly mention to you was the color vision adaptations that sea turtles have in their eyes. So first of all, sea turtles are, we humans, we are trichromatic. What does that mean? It means that in our eyes, we have three different kinds of cells that are sensitive to different parts of light, the electromagnetic spectrum. That, that makes us trichromatic. Turtles, both freshwater turtles and marine turtles, have a fourth kind of cell, which also makes them sensitive to ultraviolet light. And that's very interesting because ultraviolet is a part of the spectrum that penetrates into the ocean very little. But of course, turtles also, the females come on land to lay eggs, to nest. They might have a use for it on land, but we don't really know. But aside from the fact that they have sensitivity to ultraviolet, um, they have a very interesting adaptation on their eyes in their retina that is called colored oil droplets. So if you take a turtle's eye, you cut it, unfortunately open, and you look at it under the microscope, you look at the light sensitive cells, you will see these scattered spheres of colored oil droplets. And only a handful, all birds have this, hand, rep, reptiles ha, have this, and a handful of fish have this. And what their purpose is, is hypothesized in birds to enhance color discrimination. So you can sense more colors because you have this special apparatus in your eye. So for birds, this makes a lot of sense because birds are very colorful. They live on land, there's broadband light on land, so their colors come out fully. They can communicate with their colors, they can attract mates, they can camouflage. But for turtles, who, with all due respect to turtles, are not colorful and they live in oceanic habitats that get duller and duller with depth, what could be the role of these oil droplets? Could it still be that they enhance color discrimination? We, we don't know, and we cannot assume based on what we know from birds is true for turtles. So we wanted to investigate this by designing a camera that sees the world, that senses the world like a green turtle, and has a computational, uh, mechanism inside sorry the lights in my office went off i'll mo move to turn them on and i'm back so we built a camera essentially to investigate the role of these oil droplets and we had to build a camera because cameras that are existing in the market are built for the human visual system. And I, as I just explained, turtles have a much more complex visual system than we do. So this camera that we built, you see in this video, its first dive in the Red Sea has a sensor that is sensitive to 16 different points of the electromagnetic spectrum, not three like humans are, 
not four like turtles are, but a lot more bands. So it allows us to sense the light in a more complete and objective way and not bias it by the uh, human visual system or even turtle visual system. We can use this kind of sensor for simulating vision for any animal. It's a, it's a sensor that has 16 bands. We built a simple Linux computer around it. We built an interface for it, for the diver to record and view videos and images. And we put everything in a housing and we took it diving in habitats where turtles live and we filmed them. So what, what did we find? It's interesting because it appears that oil droplets also give turtles an advantage with color vision. So here on the left, there's a scene underwater with a turtle that we simulated with the full visual system of our turtle with oil droplets. And in comparison on the right is the same scene if we assume turtles without oil droplets. So the, the difference in the, the richness, the diversity of colors is striking. And even though I just said marine environments are not colorful because of the light, it makes a big difference. So thus far, these are the, if you will, the engineering results. What does this mean for the life of the turtle, for the visual ecology of the turtle? We don't know yet. And that's to be investigated by doing experiments with turtles. We cannot investigate that from camera images. We have to see how they behave, how they process the visual signals in their brain. So this is another project that's ongoing. And that actually brings me to my um, core of my talk today, which is why are there colors in the ocean? What do colors mean? Can colors give us scientific insight? And I'll tell you the answer right away. Yes, absolutely. Colors can give us tremendous scientific insight. Color of the ocean water can tell us a lot about the microorganisms that are in the water column. Here I compiled a range of scenes. Actually, these are all uh, images or places that can be accessed from Florida or maybe the southeast of the US. And from the left, you have the very extreme of very clear spring water, actually in Florida. And then with uh, going right and then down, you see the color of the water changing from blues to greens to browns uh, and yellows and the visibility worsening. So these colors, which we can, uh, we generally assume the ocean is blue and we lose red colors faster than other colors. This compilation of images tells you that's only sometimes true. In natural water bodies, we also lose sometimes blue colors or green colors. And when we have very murky, turbid places, we have brown water, that means we have a lot of red colors. So there's a lot of diversity in the color of the water in natural bodies of water. And this tells scientists a lot about what might be living in the water column. And actually, Sailors and scientists from 1800s, since 1800s, have been traveling on ships, taking water samples, comparing those samples to a, uh, a, a rubric of known colors, and then marking them, grading them, trying to make sense of what color is this water and what does that mean. You can imagine that's a very tedious thing, given how big the ocean is. You can take a sample from one location, travel two miles to another location, and a lot could be happening in between. So in addition to us understanding what these colors mean, one advance uh, in ocean science has really put the meaning of colors in a scientific sense. And that advance was our ability to sense the global ocean and the color of the global ocean from space. I'm showing here a map from 1989, and this was the first time we were able to put together a global map of ocean color that we sensed from instruments on satellites. The coloration is false, so obviously the ocean is not pink or purple, 
Here it represents the false colors represent represent a concentration of uh, phytoplankton, which are tiny organisms that we cannot see individually with our eyes, but they photosynthesize. And as they use light, photosynthesis means using light's energy to produce food and sugars essentially producing food for everything in the ocean to eat when they do this they change the color of the water and we can sense that from space and this has really revolutionized oceanography and if you read the history of this in the 60s and 70s when some scientists suggested that we should be able to do this from space others said you're crazy, that's never gonna happen. Even if we could sense the whole ocean from space, we're never gonna make sense of anything that we can see. Well, today we can do this at very high resolution on a daily basis. And what we see has really, as I said, revolutionized our understanding of the ocean. Because previously when sailors or scientists were in a boat and they traveled somewhere to take water samples to compare and then they went to a station two miles north, they just assumed everything in between this, those two points varied linearly. But you see from these images that there is nothing in the ocean that varies linearly or smoothly. There's turbulence, there's eddies, there's currents, there's uh, vortices. So it's really this complete picture that has allowed us to make sense of colors in the ocean. But some people would argue, and I might be the first one among those, that the fact that the ocean water has color is a huge problem because it blocks the color of everything else in the ocean and every photo we take turns out blue or green. And then we cannot know the colors of anything that lives on the ocean floor that swims in the in the ocean so what do we do about this before i move forward i want to take a very brief moment and tell you what i mean by color because color is actually a subjective sensation defined for the human visual system and it's simply the interaction between the reflectance of a surface what is reflectance it's a physical property of a surface that uh, that essentially says which wavelengths a surface absorbs in and which wavelengths it reflects, it transmits. And the surface only has color when it interacts with the ambient light. So you park your white car under a yellow night at night, your car will look yellow, but it's white, but the light is yellow. So it's the interaction between a surface and the light and it's all relative to the sensor. In other words, who's looking? Is it a turtle who's looking at the surface or is it a human who's looking at a surface? So this is actually a subjective definition which depends on the sensor and it depends on the ambient light. And now I want to briefly, very briefly show you how an image is formed underwater. And we're going to use this diver. So here it's a bit difficult because I cannot play you my slides. I actually have animations that I wanted, you, I wanted to show, but uh, we'll just make do with what we have. This diver wants to take a photo of the octopus. And the photo that will, the image that will form in his camera, unbeknownst to him, is actually an addition of three different images together. And these images, we, we call in our field the direct signal, the backscattered signal, and the forward scattered signal. So very briefly, the direct signal is the image that is formed with the light that comes from the sun, it goes through the water column, it hits the skin of the octopus, and then it reflects directly to the camera sensor without scattering right and left. It goes the straightest path it, it uh, along the line of sight and it reaches the sensor. So that's the signal I show with the blue arrow. And this is the photo the diver actually wants to take. But because there are suspended microorganisms in the water, light occasionally reaches the skin of the octopus and then scatters out and hits one of these suspended particles, as I'm showing with the yellow arrows, and then scatters finds its way back to the camera sensor. 
So this contributes to the image, of course, and it adds a layer of a of a blurry photo of the octopus. It's not too much of a noise, but it's a layer we don't want. This is called forward scatter. So the light scatters from the octopus to the camera, but along the way it travels a bit. The, the, the worst part of this image that will make the diver's image bad is the backscattered signal. So that's the signal shown with the red arrows. Light comes from the sun. It never reaches the octopus. And it just hits the particles that are scattered in the water column and scatters towards the camera. So what does that do? It creates a layer of fog. It has nothing to do with the octopus. It has nothing to do with the scene that the diver wants to uh, the, the diver wants to shoot. It just adds a curtain of fog between the octopus and the scene. And this is the reason why so many of our underwater images look blurry and occluded and blue and green. So in, in a lot of uh, the cases, backscatter is to blame. This is going to be hard without an animation, um, so I'm going to skip that. But I want to show you a real example of how the direct signal and the backscattered signal work in real world. So if you look at the first row of the images I have, I have a color chart. I mounted this color chart in the middle of the ocean on a buoy line, and I swam to it from eight meters all the way to 30 centimeters. So the first row of images you see is the raw images that my camera took. And if you look at the images far furthest away, like at eight meters, seven meters, six meters, you see that there is that occluding layer of fog that lowers the contrast, that distorts the colors, and just uh, makes the scene look really blurry. In the second row, I subtract that layer of fog. I can do that because this is a this is a test scene. This is an experiment. I'm using a color chart that's for calibration. So I can computationally calculate and remove that fog. If you look at the middle row, now you see that the sharpness of all the images, all the charts at all the distances is the same. So that's the effect of fog. And I can go one step further and I can restore the colors of the color chart by putting back the light that was attenuated based on distance. And that actually shows us that the way colors are distorted underwater are completely a function of distance. And this is very important. Remember that underwater imaging has a lot to do with the distance you image the scene from. And I'm going to come back to this later. So very briefly, just to summarize what's going on, I work on mainly, primarily work on a problem called color reconstruction of underwater images. And the problem can simply be defined as follows. We have an image taken somewhere with some camera at some depth in an unknown scene. And the colors look like on the left, everything is blue and low contrast without knowing anything about the scene. Can we recover the original colors of the scene? And maybe at this point you're thinking, well, isn't that just white balancing? And the answer is no, because I'm going to try one more time to play my slides, but you guys tell me if you see blank or if you see something. Craig, Bert, do you see anything? Sorry, yes, we see um, white balance cannot work, and then you have uh, one, two, Excellent. three, four. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so we can continue with the animations. Great. So maybe some of you work with photography and you think, why can't we just white balance underwater photos? So I will tell you why, because, because light attenuates, because light changes with the distance it travels underwater so much more strongly than in air, white looks different at every distance. So 
if you're going to white balance the image, in other words, you're going to tell the camera, this is white, adjust all the colors accordingly, which white are you going to use? In this photo, I have six color charts. There's five on the bottom and a sixth one the diver is holding. And I extracted the white patch from each of them and I put them side by side. So you can see that the white is not the same color in each of them. So this is the reason why white balancing cannot work underwater. So how come in the year 2020, we already don't have apps and AI and everything that do this color reconstruction properly for us? And to answer that question, I'm going to take you back 200 years, okay? 200 years ago is when the first photograph was made. Not too long after, about 30 years after, the first underwater photograph was made. And shortly after, we made the first measurements of daylight underwater down to about 500 meters depth, which is incredibly amazing, something we even struggle to do at high quality even today. Of course, then there was World War I, World War II, and war is a time where a lot of technical research is done. And after the war, this becomes public information generally, which is what happened with people who worked on understanding visibility in the atmosphere. So after um, World War I, we understood in the public domain the principles of visibility in air. After World War II, this information was also available for visibility in the water, primarily through Siebert Dantley's visibility lab at Scripps. It was established at MIT and then it moved to Scripps. And in the 60s, we had the first underwater camera, the famous Calypso. 1963, Dantley published his seminal paper called Light in the Sea, which we still use today. And about 75 is when the first digital camera was uh, invented and it looked like this before it became in our phones. From 1975 to 1980s, with the advance of computers and the digital cameras, we learned to simulate underwater scenes on a computer. Given all the inputs, we could build underwater scenes. And then that helped us understand how image formation underwater worked. Then came the 1990s. So this is a time now when digital cameras are available to the average consumer. They are being used in research labs. So digital images are becoming a part of research. And in 1999, a seminal paper titled Computer Vision in Bad Weather was published. What does that mean? When you're driving a car and there's fog or there's rain or there's snow, if there is a camera which might have been helping you drive, can the camera see better without the fog, without the rain, without the snow? How can ha we have computers that see better than us in bad weather? And in this paper, they worked out beautifully the mathematics of how that vision in a camera sensor should work. But then what happened after is for the next 20 years, scientists use this equation that was derived for the atmosphere to improve the colors and visibility of underwater images. And uh, Mert, I'm still assuming you guys can see my slides, right? If something looks stagnant or it's white, please interrupt me again. You yes, can see I the will. timeline. Okay, great. Uh, uh, no timeline yet. Uh, you cannot see the timeline? No. Okay. We still, we're still on the way. Oh, there's the timeline. There's a timeline, but you cannot see an animation. Okay, I, I, I'm so sorry. I really don't know why uh, this is not working without with animations. Well, uh, the important point was that for 20 years, scientists use an equation that was derived for the atmosphere in the ocean. And there's a few reasons why that shouldn't work. And we spent three years understanding why that shouldn't work and published a new equation for the ocean. I'm not going to go into details of the equation. I just want to show you one thing. Here's a scene on the left in fog, in air. It's a pumpkin patch. You can see the orange pumpkins and there's fog. And on the right is 
um, a scene from actually the Red Sea that there's a diver who's trying to take a measurement on the ocean floor. So just by looking at this image, there is a couple of things that are very obviously different. First of all, on the left where you have fog in the atmosphere, you can still see some tens of meters, right? This is a pumpkin patch. We can see pumpkins quite a ways back. And we still, even though there's fog and the visibility is occluded, we still have, we still have visibility. But on the right, this diver is maybe a meter away from me. Actually, we were connected by a line because it was so turbid, so we don't lose each other. And the point is the visibility is lost very quickly. You don't have tens of meters underwater. So it happens, the loss of visibility happens very strongly. But second, look at the photo in air. Yes, there's fog, but the fog is white. There is rarely, unless you're in a very polluted area with smog, there is rarely a pink or blue or purple fog. Uh, maybe there is often yellow smog, but there's no color cast. In contrast, underwater, there is always a color cast. There is never a time that the water is white, right? It's always blue or green or brown. So these two differences should have been enough for scientists to know that you cannot take something for vision in the atmosphere and apply it to vision in the ocean. But that didn't happen for those 20 years. And luckily, uh, that gave us, us a chance to fix that. But you can have a new equation, you can have an excellent equation, it doesn't help anything in practice. You have to turn an equation into a method, an algorithm, a software, so that you can use it, so that you can apply it somewhere. And that's what we did next. So here's me and Tali, my postdoc advisor at the time, also from Israel. We took the new equation that we developed and we developed a method called see-through that essentially standardizes light in underwater images. And when you apply the principles that I showed you before, where everything is dependent on distance and you invert things based on distance, you first calculate distance, then you can actually reveal the colors of objects in the scene as if the photo was taken in air. So you can essentially remove the water from underwater images. And it's very important for me to emphasize here now that this is an algorithm that's not AI. What does AI mean? It means there's a black box. It means there is some learning. There's a set of training images. You train your algorithm on these images. The algorithm learns something, and then it applies it to new images it has never seen. But actually, our algorithm follows the laws of physics. There is nothing black box. When it works, we know why it works. When it doesn't work, we know why it doesn't work. So there's, that's the difference between a physics-based algorithm and an AI algorithm. Now, because uh, we are having these uh, technical challenges to do animations, I will not be able to show you the before, after, animations of these underwater images. Actually, maybe I might be able to. Yeah, we can do it like that. So here is a scene from the Florida Keys that we photographed a couple of years ago. And this is a typical underwater image. Everything looks the same color. There is no contrast. And we really cannot see the details. But when we run it through our algorithm, and we reveal what's there without the water, and we look at the photo as if it was taken in air, then it becomes a different world. You know, this is Florida Keys. There is not much hard coral left, but there's a lot of soft coral and sponges, and it's absolutely stunning over there. I'll show you one example from the Pacific. So here on the left is, of course, the raw image with the effect of light, everything is green. And once we remove the water, there is an incredible diversity of reds and oranges and blue together. You know, when I saw this image, the first time I corrected it, and I looked at it and I thought to myself, why are these colors there? 
who sees them? If the water always occludes them, who sees them? It's just, uh, it, it's, it's the most curious question to me at the moment. So I'll show you an image from the Red Sea. This is a knoll actually just outside of our research station here. And again, the image looks low contrast. It looks all blue. The, the colors are worse with distance from the camera. And when we put back the colors or when we standardize the light by removing the water, then everything becomes lush and vivid, including the objects that are far away from the camera. There's nothing that stops this method from being used for other bodies of water. It doesn't have to be the ocean, it can be fresh water. Here we have a, uh, an outdoor swimming pool in California. And when we remove the water from it, you can not only see the colors of the bathing suits of the swimmers, but also their skin tones, as if they were just floating in air. So this is the power of physics. When we use physics that is appropriate for the conditions in the ocean, then we can in enhance our visibility, we can enhance our color reconstruction. And we can learn a lot about the ocean. We can image in a consistent way. We can compare colors from things that we take in different places, at different times, with different cameras. We can all standardize this. So this development, and hopefully many other algorithms will come in the future, will one day be real time in our cameras, in our phones. Why is that not happening? Uh, that's not happening because Remember I said distance, because we have to know distance to every pixel in the scene in order to be able to do this color correction. So how can we get distance? We can use something like LiDAR. LiDAR is cheap in air, but it's very expensive underwater. And some folks, including myself, are trying to make that more affordable to research labs and the consumers. We could use stereo cameras that can give us distance. We can have algorithms in the camera, built into the camera, that can estimate distance based on some sort of artificial logic that was put in. So there's a lot to be done before we can have this work real time, but currently we know and understand how it works in post-processing. So this actually brings me to the end of my talk, and I want to answer the question, why are there colors in the ocean? but I don't think me or anybody else at this point can give you a satisfying answer. So I want to repeat my call and say, if you're interested in finding out more about why these colors are there, how they are structured, where they are, what do they mean, who uses them, which animals use them, then please join my lab to help find some answers. Here you see on this slide three different images images from three different parts of the ocean seafloor. And it's just mind blowing that there are all these colors there, but the color of the water masks them. And we see, and animals see everything as the same blue or green. So why are these colors there? I don't know. I don't know the answer today, but uh, maybe talk to me in 10 years and uh, please send me outstanding students who might be excited to work on this project by diving in the Red Sea all the time. So that's all I have. I, I think we still have time for questions and I apologize again for the technical difficulties, but happy to take questions now. Thank you so much. And you rock the technical difficulties, by the way. <laughs> yes, it was a Now fantastic. I have to turn the lights on one more time. Okay, here we go. Lights are on. <laughs> so uh, to our audience, remember you can use the question box um, to ask questions about the presentation or get more information on how you can participate in this awesome research. Um, so we do have a a question. So your question about who sees these amazing colors is mind blowing to a lot of our audience. Um, but Tori's question is, uh, do you think mantis shrimp, because they have such great eye 
anatomy are able to see it? Or can that actually make it harder to see if all the light is bouncing off a bunch of different particles in the ocean? So that's a very good question. And mantis shrimp is such an interesting animal. It has, um, I believe, actually also 16, sensitivity to 16 different parts of the spectrum. It has polarization sensitivity. So it sees an aspect of light that us humans are not able to see. But then, as far as I am aware, scientists have simulated its vision and it's not necessarily that good and it's not clear what it uses all that color information for so it's really hard it's a very uh, non-conventional eye design and visual system design so it's not so easy for me to draw conclusions to say what might mantis shrimp be seeing but i'll tell you this because of all these particles in the water that occlude everything animals must somehow solve the problem of estimating distance. And, you know, many of them have two eyes like us, and that gives them a sense, a sense of depth. But in the water, perhaps what we have is not enough. For example, if we take stereo cameras underwater, you can get depth, but you can get it to only a very short range. So the conditions in the water are just so wild that there has to have been more clever uh, solutions to sense depth. So that's something I'm not sure if the mantis shrimp gets because it has this crazy eye design. Its vision, its visual ecology might just make it relevant for it to see close enough different distances and that's it. You know, doesn't have to see five meters away maybe, also because it lives in a small den. Uh, so maybe it doesn't matter so much for the mantis shrimp. I don't know. Um, we have a question uh, from one of our undergraduates who's in attendance, um, is asking about your path. Um, and so you talked about working with cephalopods. Um, and so he's interested in knowing is that how you got into working with colors in the ocean or were you interested in the colors of the ocean even before you were working with cephalopods? What a great question. I got into the colors after working with cephalopods. I did my PhD on the patterns, camouflage patterns on cuttlefish and octopus and they they just blew my mind. I even started a PhD because I saw a presentation by Dr. Roger Hanlon in a in a, a diving conference called Boston Sea Rovers, and he talked about his research in octopus and his field trips. And I looked at that and I said, I have to do this. This is and then I, I started stalking him until he accepted me as a student. So that's how because of cephalopods I got into back into academia and because of cephalopods I got into color and color vision. Thank you for that question. Yeah, no problem. Um, I guess this kind of is a question for both of you. So Dr. McLean, it seems like somebody's very familiar with your work as well. Um, so uh, the question is, so what, what do you, you hope for the future? And then to Craig, how will that how will this advance the deep sea invertebrate stuff that you do? Is it me first or what are you doing? Either for? one. <laughs> <laughs> so Guess what is first. your hope for your research? And then Craig, how does her research then impact yours? Sure. Well, uh, maybe, uh, my natural next step in my research is actually what will help deep sea research. Everything I showed you today, because it relies on physics, it works under natural light because we natural light is very well characterized. We can build it into our mathematical models, but I cannot say the same for artificial lights we use to explore the deep sea with, right? Very small part of the ocean actually receives natural light and a lot of the ocean receives no natural light. So we use 
uh, strobes and uh, and powerful lights. So there is no robust solution for color correction for the deep sea yet. That's something me and others are working on. But uh, now let, let's hear from Craig how it looks on their end <laughs> as far as color correction goes. What are your needs? What can we help you do better? Yeah, so I mean, that's what got me most excited about both for the deep sea work I do, but the shallow water work. And, you know, I know because as you mentioned in your talk is that we're years away from this, be able to implement this in a sort of like us all having underwater cameras, but, you know, having it done in real time would be fantastic. You know, there's a lot of times where we've done, you know, uh, deep sea dives with it uh, with remote operated vehicle and you know the visibility hasn't been great or you know and it's kind of you know you've spent tens of thousands of dollars if not hundreds of thousands of dollars getting there than to have to scrap a dive because the visibility is low right and you know and so there's a real potential there to to basically not lose that time but but how much of the deep oceans are we missing because you know, we're not see, you know, because of the the noise and the and the absence of color and things like that, that we would be able to recognize and see otherwise. And I think the really fascinating thing about this is, you know, we as humans, like, we're really good about detecting patterns when there's color differences, like there has to be, but when colors virtually the same, we're not very good at that. We're not as good as good at picking up like textures and things like that and so you know when something may you know use the term something may catch my eye in a rov dive because it's particularly colorful or there's movement or something else but what am i i guess it's one of those things is like your algorithms and your work is allow may allow us to sort of know what we don't know absolutely in every case we might not be able to uh, reliably put the colors back but in almost every case we can we have methods to increase the visibility and perhaps seeing just a little bit further can help an ROV pilot or right. can help you assess the scene a bit better about what's going on so this is the challenge with optical imaging you know the light is is limited but we mostly make sense of things using optical images not say acoustic images especially studying uh, biology and biodiversity of things so it's hard it's a it's a hard problem very hard problem sorry you guys um so we have a question about um climate change and if that is going to change the structure of natural light and are you going to be able to change the algorithm to accommodate for those changes what a interesting question thank you for this question and i want to take this opportunity to tell everybody who's listening or who any everybody who watched the talk later if uh, climate change is not among the things that keep you up at night it absolutely has to be so uh, when as we move forward with our current lifestyles and we continue to impact the atmosphere and the ocean and the oceans warm and sea levels rise it's going to affect not just the light in the ocean but how much light reaches in certain parts of the ocean and animals and plants other organisms that are uh, acclimated and live in certain regions are maybe going to go extinct if they are not sessile if they can migrate maybe they will migrate other places so a lot will change in terms of the algorithm actually things are good because i built it so robust that it doesn't need to know anything about what's happening in the water so if because of climate change the water became more turbid in a given location compared to today, the algorithm would just solve for a more turbid case as if, you know, today if I go to a murky harbor and it's just bad visibility. So from that regard, we will be able to handle it up to a limit, but definitely the life in the ocean are not going to have enough time to robustly adjust to the changes coming with warming and sea level rise and acidification. 
I hope that answers the question. I think it did, yeah. And then one last question, and um, because it is also a very timely um, topic to bring up, um, but it's about microplastics in the ocean. Yeah. And uh, if they scatter light differently, and if that's something that you also have to think about, or is that something that your your algorithm can already handle? Another fantastic question. What a great audience. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe you would consider joining my lab? Uh, <laughs> some members I think we, of the we audience. might have two out there. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. So the, uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what's in the water because with a camera, I can only sense what's called uh, scientifically the apparent properties of the water. In other words, if you take a water sample and take it to the lab and look inside it, you could tell the plastics versus the plankton versus whatever else is in it. But to the camera, it all comes as a blur. So I, I don't have the refined ability to look further down. Do microplastics change the way light is reflected in the water column i could i don't know a quantitative answer but if i were to guess absolutely uh, probably also depends on the type and the concentration of them and that would be a very interesting project to look at and again my lab is uh waiting for brilliant students to ask questions like that perfect all right, we have other questions coming in, but I want to be sensitive to your 4 a.m. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to take more questions. Actually, they're great questions, so I'm here. If uh, the audience has time, I'm here. Yes, yeah, so what I'll do um, is I will uh, follow up with you. Um, there's a couple of questions about like uh, chemical pollution <laughs> that are now coming in. Um, I probably think it's about the same kind of answer uh, for that kind of stuff, but um, I'll follow up and make sure, sure. those answer those questions, see it's late for me, <laughs> those questions get answered. I want to thank, oh my gosh, this was an amazing presentation and a great talk. Probably what Craig and I were chatting during it, probably one of the <laughs> best ones. <laughs> that we've had so i want to thank you so and the, yes again thank you so much thank yeah, you pulled it off with technical difficulties <laughs> in the middle of the night <laughs> you know it's always a mystery it worked just fine when we tested it right so. it sure of did course. it sure did <laughs> All right, you all. I want to thank our audience too. Our audience has been wonderful in making the time to visit with us on a holiday weekend or near a holiday weekend. It's just amazing and reflect how much we appreciate our our community and supporters that are out there. Yes, Craig, and I want to thank you. Thank you both as well. Just Absolutely. remember to go to the online store to purchase your LumCon swag that uh, you know helps support our summer students with scholarships as well as to help support our research. You can get t-shirts just like the one that Mert's wearing. Well, mine's mine's kind of vintage now. <laughs> oh, that's right. It's LumCon Classic. We have new ones now, but there's a whole variety of hats and drinkware and t-shirts. That's um, right. <laughs> do you Sorry. ship to Israel, Craig? We can. I can absolutely ship you something. It's no, the link no, no, that no, you that, to talk. Uh, uh, next time I visit, I can. I'd be happy to visit you in person and pick up one. Let's not uh, emit gases for for swag. <laughs>